So, hello everybody. I think we, we can start. Um, we are going to see what is new uh, since the last time we did a uh, ARM Linux uh, checklist. Um, first, let's introduce myself. I'm Gregory Clement. I'm working at Free Electron, um, where we do uh, development uh, 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 based on uh, focused on uh, open source. And uh, myself, I am um, contributor on uh, kernel support for the uh, many uh, um, Marvel SOC and uh, recently on a uh, 64-bit uh, SOC, the Armada uh, 3700. Uh, uh, um, uh, and I'm also a co-maintainer of the uh, uh, Marvel ABU uh, subsystem architecture. Um, so some background about uh, this, this talk and uh, the ARM64. Uh, in December uh, 2012, uh, there was an initial support of the ARM 64 bits, uh, which was merged in the kernel uh, 3.7. Uh, so here the, the first uh, pull uh, of it. Uh, at this stage, there was no real hardware, and it's only um, a few months later that there was the support for the uh, first uh, ARM 64 soak, and it's only uh, one year later that there was a support for a second uh, ARM64 uh, uh, SOC in uh, 3.18, uh, and this time through uh, the ARM SOC um, maintainer. So, uh, first question is uh, why this, um, this new architecture? Um, usually, it's come uh, with new recruitment and a new development process. And, but uh, ARM64 is still an ARM architecture. Um, and this talk is an attempt to summarize uh, some of the difference and the similarities uh, with ARM32 bits and provide guidelines um, to help uh, developers uh, for new uh, ARM64 bits uh, to mainline them uh, in the kernel. But it might be also useful uh, if you just want to port some board uh, uh, on the kernel. Um, part of the talk uh, will be based on the Thomas talk uh, did uh, three years ago, uh, but we are going to focus this time on ARM64, uh, and also uh, there was some update on the common part between ARM64 and ARM32. Um, then let's see the difference between ARM32 ARM bits and ARM64 bits. Um, so in kernel, ARM32 bits is from ARM v4 to ARM v7, uh, whereas uh, ARM64 bits is actually one mode of the ARM v8. Uh, and the ARM v8 uh, is also capable to, to run in a 32 bit mode. And the name of the 64 bits mode is uh, Arch 64, um, but uh, at the end, in the kernel, uh, we prefer to call it ARM 64. Um, the ARM 64 come, obviously, with the support of 64 bits uh, bus, uh, but also with virtualization, virtualization instruction and uh, other improvement. Um, so this new architecture was not merged with ARM 32 bit, and there were some uh, questions about it uh, at the beginning. Um, the first reason is that the assembly code is different. Um, also, the system code interface is, di is different. It uses a new uh, uh, ABI. Um, then also, the, um, now most of the platform support uh, for the ARM 32 bit uh, has already moved in the driver. And even the uh, infrastructure that could be common between uh, ARM 32 bit and ARM 64 bit should also go uh, outside uh, ARM 32 uh, architecture, ARM 32 directory. So that's why that there is no real reason to uh, uh, share uh, the same directory. And another reason also is it helps to start from a fresh implementation without having to uh, support legacy uh, platform. 
Uh, a first important thing if you want to push uh, uh, support for your new uh, ARM64 uh, SOC on the main line is to know uh, who are the maintainers. Um, so, uh, Catalin Marinas and Will Deacon are uh, the maintainers for the core ARM64 supports. And actually, there is few reasons that you have to send code directly to them if you just push a new uh, ARM SOC, uh, especially if it already uses a Cortex something um, core. Then, uh, ARM Bermag and the Hall of Johnston are the ARM SOC maintainers. And so all the ARM64 and still the ARM SOC code must go through them. And they ensure the consistency between how the various uh, SOC family handle similar problems. Uh, at the very beginning of the introduction of the port support of the ARM64 in the kernel, uh, it was Catalin and Will who take care of it, but then uh, with more and more SOC support come to the main line and also with um, common problem, common pattern with uh, the uh, legacy ARM support, then it goes through uh, the ARM SOC uh, tree. And of course, you also need to interact with the other subsystem maintainers. So um, here is uh, the list of, of them. Uh, if, we, if you have a look on the, what we did uh, three years ago, there are a, a few differences, but not, not so much. Uh, maybe there, in ARQ chip, there are new maintainer and in the driver clocks too. So, um, if you want to know where is the code and when to submit, uh, for this part, there is no change since the last time, but we are going to see it again. Uh, so the AMSOC Git tree uh, is on the kernel.org. Um, in uh, the four next branch, you will have what will be uh, submitted by the AMSOC during the next merge window. And generally, and it's still true, uh, the AMSOC maintainer uh, wants to have all the code. Um, two weeks ago, uh, actually, they, they want to have it for the RC, uh, RC6 uh, release of the, of the kernel. Um, and of course, it depends if there is a small um, change to add. They can take it later, but if you want to do a first submission, at least you have to do it uh, two weeks ago, two weeks before uh, Linux opened the merge window. Uh, if you submit your code during the, uh, the Linux merge window, it's too late and there is no way it will be integrated uh, in, the, in the next release. So we will have to uh, uh, wait for the next one. And the usual Linux contribution guideline uh, uh, apply. So uh, people will make comments on your code. Uh, you have to take them in account to repost and find the good balance between patience and perseverance. So you have to wait before asking some news, uh, but you have no, not to wait too long also. Um, about existing, uh, existing code, there are some changes, uh, actually. Um, in his last talk, um, Thomas said that uh, there was 19% chance that you have to throw it away completely, and now it's a little better. I, I, I think it's half chance that you have uh, to throw it. Um, so most of the time it's because the SOC support code by the SOC vendor um, do not comply with the Linux coding rules, uh, they do not respect the Linux infrastructure, and they have major design issue and also still ugly. Um, for ARM64, um, the, the port is still pretty new, and so this SOC vendor didn't have time to be too creative, so there is no two horrible things in it. And even for ARM SOC vendor, um, some of them have reduced the gap between their internal tree and the main like kernel. So there are still some difference, but it's become better. Um, and um, some of them still rely on the source base on a very old fashioned kernel, uh, which predate to the device tree, for example, and predate for all the new subsystem. 
And then for this, in this, in this case, you can just uh, throw the code, but still you can use it as a reference to, to check that how it could work, how to interact with uh, the SOC, uh, because sometimes the only documentation you will have about how the SOC works will be uh, the code. Even if the code is ugly, it's better that uh, uh, no data sheet or data sheet with a TBD on it. <laughs> so um, the first step is to start minimal. Um, now for in, uh, Harm 64, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, no, no, no much thing to do. Uh, most important will be the device tree. Uh, then you will need a timer, a IQ controller, and of course a serial port. And if you are lucky, uh, maybe you just have to do this one. Um, so uh, now you, I think you may know the what the device tree is. Um, the purpose of it was to make an abstraction of what uh, the, the hardware is. Uh, the purpose is to describe the hardware uh, separately from the code. Um, and so this, uh, this uh, structure is uh, compiled in a binary uh, called D device tree blob. This blob is loaded uh, in memory by the bootloader and passed to the kernel. The kernel uh, decodes it and then gets the resource from it. The usage of this device tree is mandatory for all new ARM SOC, so uh, the new ARM 32-bit and the new ARM 64-bit, of course. And um, actually, for ARM 64, it is the only part of the port which we go under Arch ARM 64. Uh, the only code that you are going to write and put in under this uh, subsystem is the device tree. So to write your device tree, um, usually we use a DTSI file which uh, describes the, the SOC itself. And then you have your DTS file for your board. And from your board, you will include multiple DTSI depending of the, the part you, you have. Um, if you want to add your board, you have to add a new uh, a way to compile it. So in the make file uh, located in your uh, DTS, DTS directory, you have to modify the make file to add a new entry to uh, tell to the kernel to compile your board. And the main difference uh, with Arch ARM is uh, the use of a directory by vendor. So for uh, ARM 32 bits, all the device tree files are located in Arch ARM boot DTS, whereas for uh, ARM64, it's Arch ARM64 uh, ARM boot, the name of the vendor, and uh, your DT, DT device tree file. So, so a simple example for uh, Armada uh, 3, uh, uh, 3700. Uh, so we have a common file for all the uh, SOC of the family, and then each uh, uh, SOC have its own DTSI, and at the end, you have a few boards which can include uh, this uh, common file, and uh, in this board file, you will describe what is, which is specific, specified to uh, your, um, your board, so you want to activate uh, this uh, this controller or this controller you use uh, it is connected uh, through uh, this uh, new external chip and so on. Uh, another example. Um, so here is a part of a DTS uh, I file. So it describes uh, the uh, uh, Vulkan SOC. So with multiple, we have a, a node for the CPUs, a node for the PSCIs. Uh, for the tick, the timer, and then it's here that usually you put all the um, peripheral included, the peripheral controller included in your uh, SOC. And then in your DTS, um, you just uh, said that uh, here it's very simple because they make the choice that uh, to enable uh, the URAP by default. Usually you don't do this 
you better um, disable all the peripheral by default in your DTSI, and it's only in your DTS that you said, okay, I want this one, and so you usually you had a, had the status okay to to said, I want to activate uh, this peripheral for this board, and uh, the only things you have to add is uh, the memory you have on it, and this one will be will be passed to uh, know uh, on which port you will uh, print your uh, canon message and so on. Um, on ARM64, there is no Mac uh, something, and it is one of the big difference that you have in ARM32. Uh, in ARM32, you have for each new SOC family, you have a Mac something. Here, you have no, no more this kind of things. Um, so uh, there is no more C files uh, specific uh, uh, in this uh, directory, and uh, all the SOC uh, feature should be handled by uh, the drivers. And if the, drive, the feature of the SOC uh, can't fit an existing class driver, then uh, it was mentioned that the code could go to driver SOCs. Uh, I'm not sure it was still um, completely sure, but you can find some common so, uh, code for a family of SOC uh, in this place. Another file you have to modify is uh, the KeyConfig platform. It's a place where, uh, when you configure your kernel, you can select uh, the support of your um, SOC. Mm. If you compare it to uh, the kconfig for the ARM 32-bit uh, SOC, there is less uh, config symbol uh, because now many symbols are uh, set by default. When you select ARM64, it came with a, a lot of, uh, of symbol. Mm. The early code support is um, because the first thing you want to have when you start to bring up of your SOC, uh, new SOC, is to have uh, a serial uh, to get a way to have an early message. And uh, for ARM, it was uh, early, print, early printer, which was uh, used. Uh, for this one, you need to set up the URAT address at SOC level very early during the boot. And it means that uh, when you use early printer, we are not able to run the same kernel image on a different kind of SOC because uh, you have put, uh, you have hard coded the, uh, the physical address of uh, the URAT. Um, so that's why for uh, ARM64 it's no more the case. You have to use early con. So this one is not. Um, uh, written as, uh, at uh, arch level, it's written at the serial driver level. It's actually part of the console support, and in the driver is declared using early con declared or of OF early con declared. Um, for ARK controller support, uh, so if your platform uses JIG v3, v2 or v3 interrupt controller, then there are already driver in uh, driver ARK chip, so you don't have to do anything. Uh, otherwise, you have to implement a new one at the same location. Um, and this part don't change from the last talk, so uh, you still must support sparse IRQ. Um, you also uh, support multi IRQ handler. And um, if you, for the ARM32 uh, bit, um, machine, you have to uh, use DT machine start and here use uh, init IRQ. Uh, and for uh, ARM64, you have just to instant this in your DTS file. And this one is also true for ARM, ARM32 bit uh, SOC. For the timer driver, so this one, uh, must be implemented in driver clock source. Um, it must register a clock source device, which is using a free running timer with pre providing uh, a way for the kernel to keep the track of the passing uh, time. Um, so depending of uh, what you use uh, in your SOC, you can use clock source MMIO init uh, or uh, a more generic solution, which is clock source 
register uh, HZ. Um, you also need to register a clock event device which uh, allows the kernel to program uh, the timer. Um, you can also program, if you can't, the delay, the U delay. It's better to have it based on the timer than based on the loop at the beginning of the, of the kernel. Um, and also, uh, for the ARM architecture, it's mandatory that uh, they have a device tree binding and uh, it must be instantiated in your GTSI. The last part is the serial port driver. So, uh, this day, uh, many ARM and ARM64 SOC use either uh, um, uh, IT250 uh, compatible URAT or the PL11 uh, URAT controller for ARM. So, in both cases, you have already a uh, Linux driver, so you don't have anything to do. Just need to inst instantiate your DTSI. Uh, and mark the, this available, so using uh, a status e equal OK in the DTS file of your board. If you have a custom uh, URAT controller, uh, then uh, you have to do more things. So you have to write a complete driver uh, from scratch. Uh, and even for a very new SOC, so for example, the one I, uh, I work on, uh, ARM64 SOC, uh, the have the need to create a new uh, controller for URAT. So, so be ready to, to do it. It's, uh, you, we have a, a lot of URAT uh, controller and URAT driver in the kernel. Um, but you can start very simple at the beginning. You don't have to support all the fancy stuff that the hardware designer can add on it. If you want to just to do the bring up, you just have to have a mean to send data on the side line and read data on it, and that's all. Um, and do not forget to include the early con support. It will help you during the big up to have a message uh, at the very big beginning of the, of the start of the kernel. And for this part, the maintainer is uh, Greg uh, Quartman. So at this end of the step one, at this point, your system should boot uh, all the way to a shell. So you, you, it's possible that you don't have any storage device, but you can boot uh, in a minimal root file system using uh, initramfs. Um, note that for the ARM64, the kernel does not compress and decompress itself. Uh, so if there is no support in the bootloader 2, uh, then the, the image to load can be pretty large, around 20 megabytes, uh, where on the kernel I use. And so at this point, it's time to submit your basic ARM64 SOC support. And don't wait to have all the driver and all the features. Uh, it's better to submit something minimal as soon as possible. Even for, uh, especially for the first submission, you will have some review, maybe some change to do. So it's better to change it from the beginning. So as I said, um, if we go back there, okay, here. So. Uh, and it's likely the case if you use uh, a, corte um, a cortex something from uh, harm uh, and use um, as a, um, a compatible uh, driver, it's possible that you already have the, the timer driver, or already this one and this one. So you can start by just writing a device tree uh, if your SOC is not too exotic. Then uh, the step two is uh, adding uh, infrastructure for your SOC, so uh, the pin mixing, uh, the GPIO, and the clocks. Mm. Because until now, uh, it's running, but uh, you really rely on what uh, have been done in the bootloader. You rely but the, you count on the fact that the bootloader has started the clock, are, um, I set up the, the pin mix for you, so it will work, but as soon as you want to change something uh, from the bootloader, or if you want to go back from suspend or something like that, then you will need a better infrastructure. So the clock framework uh, has been added in 3.4. Um, this framework implements the clock get, clock boot, uh, and so on, so the IP usage for the device driver. It implements some basic clock drivers, fixed rate, gateable, and some newer one now. 
and allow the implementation of your custom clock driver. Um, it allows also to mix some basic driver uh, using the composite clock. Um, it allows you to declare the avail available clocks and how they are associated to the, uh, to the device in the device tree. They provide debug FS for the clock tree. Uh, they are implemented in driver clock. Um, so if you want to see more, I gave a, um, a talk on it uh, three years ago. So the, uh, the PDF is available and I think there is also a video. Um, and the new trend is, is to now have only one node or very few nodes um, and which will expose all the clocks that can be uh, consumed. Uh, so it's uh, allowed to have uh, um, to be more flexible when you want to add or uh, remove some clock or to uh, also to do some power management that uh, to not have uh, put them in the ABI because as soon as it's in device tree, you are not supposed to change the device tree. Uh, if you put everything inside one node, you, it's more flexible for you to, to change it. And also it's uh, something which is asked by the clock maintainers. So this one is pretty new. It's the main difference between uh, the last talk about it. So some example uh, on the driver side. So on the driver side, usually uh, during the probe, you get uh, your uh, uh, reference on your clock. And then when you start, you enable your clock. For the UART here, you also need to have the, the clock rate. And uh, when you want to shut down your system, you, you can just uh, disable your clock. And when you're finished with your uh, driver, you can remove uh, your clock with a clock put. However, um, now there is also uh, the manage API on the clock uh, uh, driver. So if you use just DVM clock get here, you don't have to use uh, remove. It will be done directly by, uh, by the kernel for you. Um, at the device tree level, uh, so you can have so few, uh, usually you can have a, a clock block, which is more uh, clock, fixed clock, uh, which don't rely on, uh, <laughs> on a, um, a register. So they are in the block clock. And then later, the real uh, driver, which depends of a register, is associated later. And also, uh, you still have it's pretty common to have a clock with depend of other clock uh, to have a representation of your clock tree in your device tree. Uh, and now how a device can use it is just uh, here, uh, clocks and a reference on your clock. So here it's a, a, a node which expose a lot of different clocks. So that's why we have a, a, a clock cell of one, so that means that you can have several um, clock here. So here we have reference on the clock, and here is a number to, to, to tell which clock of the node we want to use. Uh, now, a big picture of how it, it is. So we have the clock framework. Uh, it is accessed by device driver to use a public clock API. Um, the device tree uh, describes the clock and the relationship, and uh, the clock framework uses the clock's operation. So some of them are provided by uh, the clock framework itself, and some of them you have to uh, write them if you um, if you can't use the basic one. Um, another uh, part of the infrastructure of the SOC is the pin mixing. So um, the need of pin mixing is because the SOC integrates uh, many more peripherals that the number of available pins uh, uh, allow to expose. So many of those pins uh, are multiplexed and they can either be used by a function A or a function B or C or GPIO, for example. For example, for if the function can be uh, parallel LCD line, um, SDA, SCL lines for the ice uh, the MISO and MOSI for SPI, and so on. So 
this mixing uh, is a software configurable and depends on how the sock is used on a particular board. So it really depends of the design of your, of your board and uh, how the hardware designer decide to use uh, the function, the feature uh, of your SOC. So here's a small principle. So we have several blocks which share only two pins and depending of your function, you can map them on a function or another function. Um, so the, well, it's not so new now, but <laughs> the pin control system uh, is here to uh, solve this problem. Uh, it is developed and maintained by uh, Linus Foilege and it is implementing its driver pin control and so it provides an, uh, an API for the driver uh, and um, so an API to develop the device, the pin control driver and an API to use this pin control from uh, the driver. It also uh, offers an interaction with the GPO framework. Uh, so you see more or less the same thing. The main difference between the clock uh, framework is that you also have a relationship with the GPO driver, uh, which can also uh, embed a IRQ chip uh, driver and GPO chip driver. So how you um, declare them? Um, uh, so at your uh, device tree level, you uh, de declare them by, uh, uh, for each group of pin, uh, you declare them as groups and as functions they can use. Uh, something uh, more or less new for it is, until recently, uh, each uh, implementation have its own a name, so you, 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 you had Marvel group, you have uh, uh, Sun 60 group, and so on. And now it's better to try to use the, um, the common name uh, from the pin control subsystem. Uh, and so when you want to use it, for example, on the uh, Android uh, DC2 DTS file, the board, uh, so uh, you uh, said that you want, want to use uh, this configuration and it was the one which will be used by default. Um, note that in this case, if you use the default one, uh, at the driver level, you don't have to do anything. It's the framework which take care of use the default one. But if on your, uh, uh, at your driver level, if you want to use a specific configuration, then you can use the, um, the pin control API. Um, but if you just want to use the one um, uh, set by the DTS, you don't, don't have to add anything new uh, at your driver. Um, so the GPO driver is the last point you have to, to you can uh, develop. Uh, and it's uh, now must be uh, in driver's GPIO, and if uh, the GPIO pin can be mixed, uh, then it must interact with a pin control subsystem to get the proper uh, mixing. No? Yes, it's not the, the, the common things to do, but y you can have some parts, like you said, for program for um, uh, program management or something like, like that, who you want to change the pin control behavior. Or, for example, you can do it also for the FPGA if you want to load the FPGA on the fly. 
you change the behavior of your uh, pin because they are, they are going to be uh, connecting in different way to the, your FPGA, so you change the behavior of the the pin you have at this time. So it can be a, a usage for, for it. So uh, it's the end of the step two, and then from step three, you are going to develop more advanced uh, feature and more drivers. Uh, and so it can be a network driver, SPI driver, but here it's less something related to uh, architecture, it's just developing driver. Uh, however, there is something specific to uh, the ARM system. First thing, each device driver must have a device tree binding. Um, a binding this describes the compatible string and the property that a DT node uh, must carry. And this binding also must be documented in device tree bindings. Um, and some particular things for the 64-bit supports. Um, so uh, most of the ARM64 uh, SOC reuse driver developed for the ARM32 bits. Uh, the driver uh, supposed to be portable, but uh, as until recently they are there was a was only used on 32-bit architecture. There are some bugs that could have been missed. Uh, and so you have ready to pay attention with it. For example, uh, use a UID pointer to cast pointer. Uh, like until now, you just can do a void star and it, it was okay and uh, there is no problem. Now you have to do it. Also, you have to pay attention that the peripheral bus uh, can have a smaller size than the uh, CPU bus. Um, on many peripheral I see they still use a 32 bit uh, uh, bus when you want to address them. So you still use a write L or, or, or read L, for example. And you, the data size you want to use is you have to really specify that is U32 or E32 to be sure that it will match uh, the size of your, of your bus, of your physical bus of your peripheral. So, um, in conclusion, the code in Arch ARM64 uh, tree is cleaner than the one in uh, uh, ARM SOC, uh, but it benefits uh, on all the constellations done on Arch ARM. Uh, so, there is a lot of the work which has been done on Arch ARM and uh, which will also be done with uh, ARM64 uh, in mind. And uh, but so he get the best of the arm, uh, arch arm without having to deal with all the legacy code. Um, that means that adding an initial support for a new arm uh, 64 uh, SOC uh, need very few lines uh, of code now. So as I said, if you are lucky, uh, the specific part of, of arch uh, 64 is, is very few. It's just a few lines of a DTS file and a, a few entry in the make file of the DTS and a few lines in the CAC config, and that's all. If you use, for example, a Cortex-A53, uh, 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 for example. Um, however, there are still some, it's also because some of the complexity now is hidden in a firmware, the SCPI or PSCI, and uh, the power management is still uh, challenging. Um, there is still a code which uh, remains in Arch ARM, which is uh, related to the power management, and one solution for ARM64 is to not have at very less a code inside the kernel, but just inside the firmware. So that's a way to have less complexity inside the kernel, but it's put just uh, behind a uh, firmware. So if you have any question. No? Yes? You, you mentioned the timer as a um, essential protocol. Um, is it actually needed to use on many new SOCs? Because you have the arch timer, right? Yes, it, it, it's only, it's only that's, that's why, as I said, if you use a Cortex something with, uh, which came with an arch timer, then you don't have to, to, uh, to develop one. It depends on your SOC and of, of what you use. Uh, there are still some. Uh, uh, ARM V8 uh, SOC, which don't use a Cortex uh, A something, uh, 
uh, I think there is one from Tigra, or it's still possible to have uh, some SOC which don't use the cortex, so which don't come with a timer. You can also have uh, multiple timer in one uh, SOC. For example, on Armada 1, we have uh, also the legacy timer, which is still present. Uh, so, of course, they are, we don't use them for the initial port, but we can use them for other usage. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, some old 32 bit ARM chips uh, supported uh, the choice of NDNS. Do it's still the case. It's the case for all the ARM uh, so SOC. Do, do modern chips support this? Huh? Yes. And how does it look like in kernel core? Um, uh, yes. But the rest is kind of in the core. For for the Indian support, so the um, the kernel is, the ARM kernel is supposed to support it. Uh, however, um, uh, I know that Ben Dukes uh, do a lot, lot of work around it, and even if at the kernel level it should be okay, he found a lot of issue in the driver for the same reason that you have issue when you when you switch from 32 bit to 64 bit. You're supposed to be portable, so you're supposed to pay attention on Indian S, but as it was not um, tested in this uh, big Indian case, you have a lot of issue about it. But there is no real problem about it. You just have to check that the driver you want to use don't uh, make some assumption of being in uh, a little Indian or a big Indian. You have a question. Yes. You you have to. It depends of what you want to use. If you want to use a mainline kernel, you have to use the DTSI defined in the mainline kernel, and the DTSI is really supposed to describe the hardware, so you can't change it. You can add something. Is the DTSI there is some missing part? Or maybe there are some bugs, but yes. So you include your DTSI, which represents your SOC. No, you have to. You, you will have to put it in the vendor directory. Yes. It's just a, a, a way to TD the the file is not really. Uh, just to, to say that uh, you are going to use this SOC, so your board will be close to this SOC, and that's all. No more questions? So, thank you.